my name is Catherine Murray. I'm Associate Dean Undergraduate Programs in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. One of the joys of this job is, is sometimes curating interesting speaker series. This speaker series was conceived of as an opportunity for us as a faculty to think about the FAS uh, 150, Canada 150 challenge um, facing the country and really try to um, connect with the community and identify ways, interesting ideas and ways that scholars could engage with important problems of the day and really demonstrate um, the value of an arts and social sciences perspective on even um, rather banal national celebrations like Canada 150, which incidentally have come under hot uh, national controversy from time to time. In any case, it's a great opportunity for us to reach out, and one of the goals of this series was to actually design introductory talks to important problems from a number of different disciplinary perspectives. But the idea was to try to communicate not only the importance of some of the ideas, but to communicate in a way that would demonstrate to high school students and people coming into the first year of university the importance of um, different disciplinary approaches to problems and ideas of the day. This is the 11th and final of our series, of a tremendous series this year. We've been taping them and actually intend to be using them in parts of our uh, community outreach to high school students um, across the Lower Mainland area. I'm very delighted today to introduce Dr. Lisa Shapiro, my counterpart in the FAS uh, Dean's Office, responsible for graduate programs and research. What is interesting in working with Lisa over the uh, last year is to discover her deep interest in um, identifying um, critical thinking in accessible ways for people in the community around us and for students and also her commitment to advancing some dialogues throughout the Lower Mainland um, between teachers in high school, um, philosophers with an expertise, a disciplinary content base or an historical perspective on critical thinking, and indeed teachers and uh, administrators throughout the Lower Mainland. So FAST will be uh, co-sponsoring with Faculty of Education an upcoming roundtable actually around critical thinking why critical thinking? Uh, the roundtable will be happening February 9th, and it will be actually trying to engage with provincial educators who are responsible for rethinking the kindergarten to grade 12 curriculum. Critical thinking is now becoming a very frequently used term in a number of different contexts. And critical thinking will be one of the apparent core competencies together with creative thinking, which will be expected of all grade 12 graduates um, in the Lower Mainland in the kindergarten to grade 12 system. But what is it? How is it defined? How would we possibly as assess it? How, furthermore, do we as teachers and practitioners within the SFU community advance critical thinking and make it materially mean something in the world? Lisa will be sharing that view with us today, and I'm also uh, interested to note that she has a tremendous cheat sheet here, a guide to further reasoning and uh, reading uh, for you, which has been distributed, and we'll make it available together with the lecture on tape. And I'm also delighted to welcome our uh, student, Michael Troyer, who's over here, who will be helping sort of curate a question and answer period uh, today. He's pursuing a philosophy major as a second BA degree, and what is really interesting is that his first degree is in music. So thank you. Our order of business will be to introduce Dr. Shapiro, who will speak for roughly 25 to 30 minutes, something like that. And then we'll turn it over to Michael to read, uh, to begin the questions, and then finally uh, invite you to all have lunch with us uh, for the period of pizza and polemic. So we should be finished in about an hour. Thank you. Dr. Shapiro. Great. Thank, thank you so much, Catherine, and thanks to those of you for coming. As you can see, the title of my talk is Public Reason, Building Community by Thinking Critically. Um, Public reason is a term of art to philosophers, and one of the things I'm going to be doing today is fleshing out just what, 
we mean by public reason. But I'm going to do that uh, through the history of philosophy. Uh, and um, because what I work on in my own research is the history of philosophy, so that's where I feel most comfortable. Then I'm going to illustrate it further by looking at a very timely case, uh, the NFL, pro recent NFL protests around, uh, that involved kneeling during the US national anthem uh, and uh, the response to that protest. Um, and then hopefully there'll be time and I'll just, uh, having laid that foundation, uh, um, present some more complicated, more complex cases uh, that, um, that, that we can try to think through how this understanding of public reason can help us uh, decide how to handle them. Um, all right, so first of all, what is public reason? Public reason, to answer that question, it might help to know a bit what reasoning is, and then we can ask what makes reasoning public. Um, and then once we've broached those two questions, we can tackle the subtitle of the talk, how thinking, um, how public reason, how thinking critically, reasoning can build community. Um, so I wanna focus on three cases from the history of philosophy. Uh, Rene Descartes, uh, Mary Astle, and Immanuel Kant. But I've th picked th these three cases just um, as examples, not as decisive cases. And on the slides, there's a long list of other people, other philosophers, who I could have picked to help illustrate some of the points uh, that I'm going to be making. Um, so let me start with Kant, because that's I, where this term public reason uh, really has its origins. Um, and Kant, in his essay, What is Enlightenment, written in 1784, um, notes that uh, the motto of enlightenment is, have courage to use your own understanding. Laziness and cowardice are the reasons why so great a proportion of men, long after nature has released them from alien guidance, not the best translation, but We'll, do, we'll live with it. Nonetheless, nonetheless, gladly remain in life, lifelong immaturity, um, and why it's so easy for others to establish themselves as their guardians. It's so easy to be immature. Um, <laughs> so for Kant, uh, um, reasoning involves essentially using your own understanding or thinking for yourself, right? have the courage to use your own understanding. The key, key points to thinking about using your own understanding is that reasoning is an activity and not something that just happens by accident. Um, to genuinely reason, each of us has to make our own thoughts, some ideas, our own. We have to own what we're thinking, and we can only do that for ourselves. So genuine reasoning, the ability to own your own thoughts involves some kind of maturity. Um, and I'll come back to this, hopefully, if we have time at the end. Um, Kant's not the first person to think of reasoning in this way. Descartes, uh, in the preface, in the first paragraph of the Discourse on Method, written about 150 years before Kant wrote his essay, What is Enlightenment, writes um, that uh, what reasoning, good sense or reasoning, is the best distributed thing in the world. For everyone thinks himself so well endowed with it that even those who are the hardest to please and everything else do not usually desire more of it than they possess. It is in this unlikely that everyone is mistaken. And it indicates rather that the power of judging well and of distinguishing the true from the false is naturally equal in all men. I'll come back to the end of that passage in a minute. And we see it a little after, about 50 years after Descartes in Mary Estelle as well. Um, Mary Estelle is uh, interested in educating women and in an effort to convince women to get a proper education, she writes, your glass, that is your mirror, will not do you half so much service as serious reflection on your own minds, which will discover irregularities more worthy of your correction and keep you from being either too much elated or depressed by the representations of the other. Um, 
So what's the upshot here? Um, Descartes takes reasoning to be an ability that we all have just in virtue of being human. And Estelle is challenging women to learn how to reason well, to focus on the workings of their own minds rather than the outfits they're wearing. Um, <coughs> and so the key points we get about what it is to reason is that reasoning is part of human nature. That doesn't mean that reasoning well comes naturally. Just because it's part of human nature doesn't mean we do it in, with the snap of our fingers. Um, instead, we need to learn how to reason. We need to develop our natural ability. And developing, in developing that natural ability, we learn to think for ourselves. And that brings us back to Kant. So you might think this raises a little puzzle, given my title. If um, how can learning to think for oneself and then actually thinking for oneself build community? Community involves bringing people together, and thinking for oneself is really for oneself. Being for oneself and being part of a community can seem to pull in opposite directions. So let me go back to Kant as a way of starting to resolve that apparent puzzle. Um, later in the essay, What is Enlightenment?, Kant writes um, that for enlightenment of this kind, that is for an enlightened society, all that's needed is freedom. And the freedom in question is the most innocuous form of all, freedom to make public use of one's reason in all matters. The public use of man's reason must always be free, and it alone can bring about enlightenment among men. The private use of reason may be quite often very narrowly restricted, however, without undue hindrance to the progress of enlightenment. But by the public use of one's reason, I mean that use which anyone may make of it as a man of learning addressing the entire reading public. Kant's key point here is that to bring about an enlightened society, people need to be free to argue in public about what's true and what's good. If you go a little in the part that isn't highlighted in blue, um, Kant's examples are don't argue, right? The officer says don't argue, get on parade. The tax official, don't argue, pay. Uh, the clergyman, don't argue, believe. We're being encouraged not to argue, but for an enlightened society, argument is critical and indeed essential. Um, and what we have to argue about is what's true and what's good. So to illustrate, that's very, at a very abstract level, and luckily the world has cooperated with me lately, and I've got a timely example that you're probably all familiar with, because uh, it's been in the news an awful lot the past two weeks. Um, uh, just a quick uh, um, kind of overview of the basic facts. In the 2016 NFL football season, Colin Kaepernick of the San Francisco 49ers started kneeling during the US national anthem before games as a way of protesting the um, differential justice that's uh, uh, administered uh, in the US justice system towards African Americans, and in particular, um, police brutality and the lack of accountability uh, of police for the deaths of citizens of color. Um, uh, the 2017 season started with this not being much in the news, uh, although Kaepernick was in the news for not being taken up as a free agent by football teams, until President Trump tweeted, uh, on September 22nd, wouldn't you love to see one of these NFL owners when someone disrespects our flag, you'd say, get that son of, the bit, son of a bitch off the field right now, out, he's fired. That's a direct quote from the Donald Trump Twitter account. Um, uh, and in response to that tweet on September 24th, which was a Sunday, the day that most football games are played, um, there was a kind of mass response by, football by teams in the NFL, football players, coaches, and owners, um, kneeling during the national anthem or 
doing something else uh, that was noticeable in unison um, during the national anthem. And not unsurprisingly, this generated a whole bunch of varying opinions. If you were unfortunate enough to watch cable news, you'd have heard a whole bunch of them. Um, but uh, you can also uh, read op-eds, um, both in the US press, in the Canadian press, and in fact, in the international press, since one of these games was played in London, in England. Um, this past Sunday, the mayhem continued uh, with continuing protests, fans booing, other fans cheering. Um, so this isn't over. Um, so how to think about this case in a way that um, uh, pertains to what we've just heard about reasoning and public reason in particular. So first of all, recall Mary Estelle. What Mary Estelle notes is that um, people, the problem with paying attention to how you look in a mirror is that your responses are all too often uh, elated or depressed uh, based on what you see in the mirror. That is, your responses are purely emotional and so subject to fluctuation. Um, similarly, we see people responding to what's going on in the NFL with a visceral emotional response. People feel patriotic, they get angry. Uh, other people uh, feel solidarity with the players in protest and feel defiant with them. Um, also recall Kant right, about uh, the deference to authority, uh, how easy it is to be immature by deferring to authority. Um, if I have a book to serve as my understanding, a pastor to serve as my conscience, a physician to determine my diet for me, and so on, I need not exert myself at all. People are simply deferring to the opinion of others. They hear someone on TV, they think that sounds good, they'll go with that. They see someone's Twitter account, they think that sounds good, they go with that. Um, in either case, these parties differ from one another. The responses are different, and they, talk, they don't talk with one another. They talk past one another. So that people end up interacting in either of these two ways of responding that I've just outlined by um, just uh, interacting with only those who already agree with them. Initial emotional responses become entrenched. Appeals to authority become solidified and the basis of authority is left unquestioned. So we can imagine things, though, looking a little differently. We can imagine that reasonable people can disagree and that they can offer arguments for their opinions. Some people can reasonably believe that kneeling during the US national anthem is unpatriotic because the flag is a symbol of what unites all citizens of the United States. Some other people can reasonably believe that kneeling during the US national anthem is a protest that reflects the current state of the liberty and justice for all that is pledged in allegiance to the US flag. And for examples of these kinds of reasons arguments, I've got a whole bunch of links on this slide and on the handout that you can go to to see different opinions both in Canada and the United States. So everyone's being polled on their different opinions or arguing for their different opinions. Um, so what's going on then when we respond to disagreement by thinking critically? Well, the first step of thinking critically is acknowledging that there can be disagreement, that disagreement's possible. And that disagreement, doing that is actually uncomfortable um, because disagreement makes you uncomfortable because when you disagree with someone, you might be forced to rethink those things that you take for granted. Um, this is, I think, what Kant means when he talks about maturity being needed to reason. You need to be able to be mature enough to admit that you might be wrong. And as we all know, two-year-olds don't ever admit they're wrong. So, <laughs> <coughs> That's not very mature. 
So acknowledging that there's disagreement um, can go two directions. One direction is the way that can often be tempting to go, I think, because disagreement is so uncomfortable, and that's to fall back on a kind of relativism, that you look at things one way and I look at things another way, and we can just both coexist with our different points of view because it's all relative, right? Resting in that kind of relativistic position, having just acknowledging there's different perspectives, but refusing to take a stand about which perspective is right or wrong, um, allows for disagreement, but doesn't move you forward in any way. Um, you can end up quite quickly from a relativist perspective into a battle of power, where one perspective um, tries to wield power uh, over the other perspective. And then what wins is the mightier of the two opinions rather than the weaker. Thinking critically and public reasoning involves something more than just acknowledging that there's disagreement. It involves considering both what you agree with and what you disagree with, considering the evidence for your beliefs, whether there's reasons to believe differently given the evidence, looking at what other people believe, looking at their reasons for believing what they do and whether you find those reasons convincing. If you do, that might be a challenge to your point of view. And if not, you should understand why you don't find those alternative points of view convincing. So then how does thinking critically build community if we're acknowledging disagreement in this way, arguing with each other? Well, arguing actually involves having shared standards of reasoning. And what are they? Well, if you're arguing with someone, you're already acknowledging that you share a commitment to get to the truth, whether it's the truth about the way things are or the truth about what's really good, right? You want to find out about that. And that commitment to respect the truth and to pursue the good entails that you're responsive to evidence about the way things are or what's good and what's bad and to acknowledge equally that one's mistaken if the, end, if the evidence counters your initial opinion. <coughs> You're also, in arguing with someone, committed to articulating the ways of putting your thoughts together that preserve the truth, right? You want to have your arguments fit together, the different thoughts that make up your argument fit together so that you're tracking the truth as you put your thoughts together as best as you can. Now, philosophers call argument forms that pre preserve truth valid arguments. Um, and logic is the work of setting out rules of inference, that is, rules of connecting thoughts together, that actually do preserve the truth. And the third thing, that's sort of connected to the first thing that you're committed to in arguing with someone is a kind of humility, a recognition of the limits of your own understanding, that you don't know everything, and that other people might know something that you don't. Um, so how does public reasoning build community? It builds community by establishing a foundation that's shared by all sides to form the bedrock of that community, a commitment to respect the truth and an articula articulation of ways of putting thoughts together that preserve the truth. Moreover, the recognition of the limits of our own understanding ensures that we remain open to new evidence and that we have respect for others who simply in not being us, have different perspectives and so different views. And Descartes says this in the end of that first pa paragraph that I showed you. Um, it's uh, natural, the power of judging well and distinguishing the true and the false is naturally equal in all, in all men, and consequently, the, diversi the diversity of opinions arises not because some of us are more reasonable than others, 
but solely because we direct our thoughts along different paths and do not attend to the same things. We pay attention to different things, we have different perspectives, and so we come to different conclusions, and what we have to do is negotiate those differences in perspective. So then thinking critically and public argument builds community by encouraging an openness to learning and to being exposed to new and different ideas as a way of reaching the truth. If we're all committed to pursuing the truth and to being responsive to evidence, we have to be open to learning new things. And equally, we have to be open to listening to other people, and in particular, to people who have different viewpoints than us, even those who disagree with us. And finally, um, so that, that involves interpersonal relations. Uh, public reasoning builds community by giving us a common language also, a language of how to express our reasons, how we're putting thoughts together, and the ways of articulating the reasons for both our agreement and disagreement. So we can pinpoint where our points of agreement and disagreement lie. It's this pursuit of the truth and striving for good in an orderly way through that shared language um, that brings us together, even if we disagree, because we can lay out what the argument is and identify the points of disagreement and then consider the evidence for and against that point of disagreement. So reasoning may be thinking for oneself, but thinking for oneself is not thinking by oneself. So now I'm answering that puzzle I posed early on. Thinking well involves engaging with other people with different perspectives to both articulate why we each believe what we do and to better understand our disagreements as we try to get things right. Thinking involves under, understanding the very standards of thinking, learning them, articulating them, and even thinking critically about them sometimes. You don't want to be thinking about your standards of reasoning all the time, but it is worth paying attention to how it is you're putting thoughts together, to thinking about logic, the rules of inference, and whether you've got the right rules of inference or what the limits of your rules of inference are on occasion. <laughs> and then committing to standards in virtue of that looking at the rules of inference to distinguishing good from bad thinking, right? You're articulating what your norms of thinking are. Okay, so that's how public thinking, uh, public reasoning can build community, or critical thinking can build community. Um, that's a nice, neat story, but um, the world is not that simple. Uh, it's simple when you're talking about the NFL, but um, some people care a lot about the NFL, uh, but many people can think about it from a distance. The real trick comes when we get to much more sensitive issues that people have personal investments in. Um, so here's some uh, additional questions that are um, sort of going in that direction. Um, one question is, um, about recognizing that there isn't a level playing field for public reasoning, right? So as a matter of fact, right, the, public, the playing field is not level. Um, some people uh, have much more power to have their voices heard than others. So there's a real question then whether the discussion, the weighing of evidence, the presentation of evidence, the evaluation of the truth and falsity of beliefs is actually um, a healthy discussion, one where the right voices are getting heard, um, the evidence that's going to actually show you where the truth lies is being presented. How do you deal with uh, um, a non, how do you try to make a level playing, an unlevel playing field more level so that many voices can be heard and evidence can be weighed. 
Um, that's a hard question because we all know what happens when everyone talks at the same time. You can't hear anything. Um, uh, so that, really, that, I think, is the hardest question. If you want to have genuine public reason, you have to make sure that quieter voices are heard. But how do you do that without um, quieting other voices? How do you have an organized discussion that includes many different voices and which every, in which, in a limited amount of time? Let's put it that way. Um, second question, which is a different kind of question, but also difficult. Uh, I've, I've suggested that reasoning is something we learn how to do, right? And that reasoning is thinking for yourself. Well, what does it mean to say you learn how to think for yourself? Usually, you don't teach yourself how to think for yourself. You rely on other people to teach you things. So in what sense are you really owning your own thoughts? if you're relying on your teachers to help you learn things? Um, that's one part of the question. And if, even if you can answer that question, there's a further question. If you take it that reason happens developmentally, at what point are you mature enough as a reasoner to enter into public discussion, to play a role in public reason? Then, let's say we're all mature reasoners, we think for ourselves, we can hear people and argue with people in a respectful way who disagree with us substantively. What does that mean for us? Do we have a duty to engage in public discussion? Is it acceptable to just stay on the sidelines? Or do you actually have to participate to be a full public reasoner and so realize your nature as a human being? Equally, do we have an obligation to listen to people who are different from us, who think differently than us? Or is it okay to just walk away when you disagree with someone? Not be disrespectful, just walk away. That's another complicated question, real life question. And I think these questions really uh, get uh, a focus if we consider some much more complicated cases than the cases of the NFL. So social media is a good one. There's nothing like social media to create an echo chamber. Um, if one of your friends posts a po politically controversial opinion on Facebook, what do the comments look like? If you disagree, do you have an obligation to post? Uh, uh, or do you just uh, unfollow your friend if you don't like the political opinion that's being presented there. Um, how do you express your opinion? How do people express differing opinions on social, me on social media, if at all? Um, a more local case, uh, censorship of high school journalism. This goes to the point about the development of reasoning. In Burnaby a few years ago, I think this was 2011, uh, judging from the link. Um, a high school new newspaper wanted to publish, uh, sorry, a high school newspaper wanted to publish a potentially controversial story on the Israel-Palestine -Palestin situation, and the principal of the school prevented that article from being published in the paper on the grounds that it would upset parents and presumably students as well, right? Um, and that student went to court and actually won his court case, but. High school paper, are students mature enough intellectually to be able to deal with the disagreement that is part of public reasoning or not? What if it was an elementary school newsletter? Would that be uh, too young to, uh, to censor the elementary school newsletter? There's a real uh, gradation of cases there. Um, University restrictions on speech. Uh, this is from McLean's. This is actual case. Um, should images comparing abortion and the Holocaust be taken down because it impedes a student's ability to focus? Find the that, that comparison 
not just the images, but that comparison, very upsetting, and don't want to have to deal with it. That's their student, a student, I can't remember the university, it was I think McMaster, I'm not sure, uh, in which the student petitioned to have those images taken down, thereby preventing a public discussion about a very controversial comparison. Um, more recently, uh, in, Va in the city of Vancouver, there at the, I think it was lab just Labor Day weekend, right? Uh, shortly after Labor Day weekend, um, the city of Van Vancouver had uh, issued a, pr uh, a permit to an anti-Muslim group. In case you're doubting it, it's the Worldwide Coalition Against Islam. Can't get much more explicit than that to say what their, their mission is. And there was a lot of anger amongst the residents of Vancouver about the granting of this permit, which the mayor, Gregor Robertson, defended and encouraged there to be a counter protest, which was also granted a permit. But the controversy was whether the initial permit should have been granted in the first place because of the very upsetting view that's represented. These are, for too many people, um, this is, uh, you know, these are real cases that test commitments to public, re public reason. And so I just want to leave you uh, with those cases to think about and, uh, and to think about just what this framework can help um, in making sense of how you want to think about these difficult cases and what the right thing to do is in those cases. And if you're interested in reading more, there is John Rawls, the recently deceased Kantian philosopher, uh, his book, Political Liberalism, initially introduced a more contemporary concept of public reason, re drawing on Kant, that he followed up with an article in 1997, The Idea of Public Reason, Revisited. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, a, a truly elegant and well-constructed argument for public reason. Now, I'm a, a, a scholar with the background in political communication. We've never been more inundated with unreason in public discourse. Uh, and it's difficult to convey to young people what is the special space a public university can bring and the forces that we can marshal amongst our disciplines and our excellent scholars in order to make a case for uh, advancing public reason. I want to turn to Michael, who may have some interesting comments to make to start the discussion, and turn it over to him, and then turn it over to you. Please. Uh, hi. I, I just thought I'd ask um, a quick question about, you mentioned something about the uh, standards of teaching the teachers who teach reason. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no. uh -huh. and I was wondering, like, about uh, how do you remove the bias that might go into how you how do you make that sort of standard, I guess, for truth? I get like you suggest truth is something objective. How do you make that sort of pure so that it like becomes uh, gets this yeah pure, pure quote? I don't know. Like <laughs> that's an excellent question, um, a philosopher's question. Um, so uh, so. Hmm. <laughs> um, so I think, uh, here's what I think, and this is just other people might well disagree with me about this. Um, truth is a regulative ideal, uh, something towards which we're striving. What's truth? It's the way things are, right? Uh, and personally, I'm of the view that there's only one world, so that things are only one way. Um, and uh, I can try to get the world right, and I can assert that things are the way they are, um, and be wrong about it. So part of what uh, being committed to pursuing the truth is, is to uh, be willing to admit you're wrong when faced with countervailing evidence, but to always be looking for but that wasn't your question. Your, <laughs> <laughs> your question was about uh, was about um, how how do you develop um, 
the rules for putting your thoughts together so that you can pursue the truth in a way that's reliable. But I think that in many ways that is the same question, right? Because you're going to come up with a set of rules for uh, pursuing the truth uh, that themselves might be revisable as you come to understand the way the world is better. Um, it's really hard to get to that point, but I think you see examples from science all the time. We have a very reliable physical theory, Newton, the, the basic laws of mechanics that begin with Newton's Principia and get developed through the 19th century. And then you get Albert Einstein coming up with a theory of special relativity and then general relativity that are not consistent with um, Newtonian mechanics. And you get a different view of what the world is through scientists paying attention to evidence. Things get even crazier when you get quantum mechanics um, put into the mix. Um, but I think you can do some, think about something similar with the rules of logic, right? That there are really good rules of inference that apply within a specific domain. Given a certain kind of conception of the truth, these rules work really well. If you turn out to revise your conception of the truth, you might need a different system of rules of inference. And in fact, there are at least more than one system <laughs> of rules of inference. Um, so it's just a process of making sure that your rules of inference are actually responsive to the standard you right. keep and constantly um, being self-critical about the standards that you're adopting for reasoning um, rather than just rest content that, that uh, those standards work because they always worked or because someone said they were the right rules of inference. Right. Um, and another thing that I was sort of thinking about was like uh, you sort of suggest that like reasoning is not this thing that's like affected by emotions, I guess, or like or no, no, that's not sort of maybe I'm distorting what you're saying. Don't mean to. Anyway, um, I was trying to avoid that. But I guess should, are you are you actually are you making the suggestion that removing sort of the like our feelings from the mix is is something that is a good thing? Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> But I can see why you'd think that that would be one of the outcomes, that we need to fall back on reason, and a reason is something that's at a remove from emotions. Um, so a philosopher I didn't talk about, who actually has a very different kind of view of what it is to reason publicly, but I think, think is right in this respect, that um, David Hume draws a distinction between what he calls violent passions and calm passions. And I think um, reasoning, even on this model, uh, is um, tightly connected with calm passions, calm emotions. Uh, that when you <coughs> are convinced by someone else's argument, there's an emotional aspect to being persuaded. And, but that's not a violent passion like anger or resentment or um, it's a tempered passion that is a result of um, being properly responsive to, that's in proportion to the way things are, right? Um, reasoning about the truth in many ways is a lot easier than reasoning about what's good because we can get, I think, better evidence for what's true through empirical science than we can for what's good because there's a lot more disagreement about what's good. There's a lot more diversity of opinion about what's good. And it's also what gets people much more emotionally uh, worked up when they uh, debate what is really good or what's really bad, especially what's really bad, that gets people very worked up. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, but you can still use the same method of thinking through your reasons for thinking something's good, including thinking through your, thinking through your emotions and your emotional responses and whether they're proportionate.
I, uh, I'm going to uh, assert my right on the microphone for a bit and open up the conversation generally, but feel free to intervene again. And I'd like to turn tables on you for a moment, okay. if I could. Um, can I ask what attracted you to studying philosophy? Uh, I think the real reason for me was it was it's kind of personal like I really wanted to like um, just hone my skills in terms of like uh, reasoning about the world actually <laughs> so this is quite appropriate um, yeah I, I found that like it helped me think about things a little bit differently and uh, helped me think about my my like problems in my life or whatever my going about the world helped me like make sense of it a little bit better so I think that was the main reason uh, for doing that. And Lisa, can I ask you why you decided to study <laughs> philosophy? It was a long time ago, Catherine. <laughs> uh, I wanted to pursue the truth. <laughs> and somehow you do get the feeling it was at a very young age she formed that uh, <laughs> desire. No, um, physicist before. It's an interesting discussion that's beginning to uh, evolve. One. Uh, one question or one, one challenge facing, I think, people who work in the academy, that is a post-secondary university, is actually to define um, the difference in the learning environment at a university, a public university, vis-a-vis -vis a high school education. And what teaching someone to learn for themselves or to think from themselves, quote unquote, is and how it differs between the two kinds of um, institutional settings. And I think that's a really, really important message for students coming to a high school, it, from a high school to a university. And, and that is around how there is more space for that individually uh, centered learning, hopefully, and how it will be, um, if you like, uh, facilitated by professors in different ways. So let's open up to uh, the audience, some questions. We'll start um, over here. One question, please. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, I remember Gandhi said lies are for cowards, and now lies are considered as alternative facts. <laughs> <laughs> My question is about, you know, a lot of uh, teenagers and youths and tone are trained nowadays to say, "Don't judge people." Now, my question is, can you reason without judging? Because to me, judge, I mean, judgment is not like a legal judgment, but observing. And, and so, because there is also this debate between, in the Senate, yeah. where one senator is saying residential school, should we, we should just pay them and get over with it. And so I think there's a difference between um, saying don't prejudge people, don't assume you understand a person's life, and saying don't disagree with people, right? And I guess I'd want to draw a distinction between acknowledging that people disagree with one another um, and uh, still respecting the people you disagree with enough to enter into a discussion with them to better understand their reasons for their point of view, that doesn't mean necessarily changing your mind, right? It, it means being open to listening to what someone who disagrees with you has to say. Um, so if what don't judge people means is so don't I disagree with people, I would disagree with that, <laughs> right? But. Uh, but, um, but I do think there's uh, respect. You, you still need to respect the people that you disagree with, and that means not prejudging them, not, not being open. Um, that means remaining open to hearing uh, and listening to their reasons for seeing things, believing what they do. Um, and just that openness is respect. And so don't prejudge people. Uh, seems right to me, um, but that's different from don't disagree with people. Another question over there? <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you so much. That was a, a great talk. Um, kind of a, a related question. Um, so I'm, I work in the Department of Philosophy. <laughs> I'm very on board with this idea of yeah. public reason, right? I, I think it's 
great and I, um, I love it and, and I, I'm on board with it. But I, I, um, it seems like, maybe just I have a skewed perspective, but it does seem like um, the way things are going that um, rhetoric, uh, manipulation, coercion, deception are really getting things moving, like, in a sense, like working in the sense of like making things happen in the world. And so I guess how can um, public reason combat what it looks like unreason, I think someone mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, Alternative facts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it seems like you would have to have reasonable interlocutors for this to work, right? And if, if people aren't being reasonable, how do we, how do we do this? I love that phrase, reasonable interlocutors. Right. Um, That's great. I cannot solve the world's problems. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, that, I guess I'm a little, this might be Pollyanna-ish, but uh, I, I retain a kind of irrational faith that if you just, so I think it's important to talk about being reasonable, right? Part of the defense against the onslaught of alternative facts, the onslaught of social media, is to be reflective about one's practices um, and to then act on the result of those reflections. So for me, right, one of the, I, that, the question about social media is a really we, real question. I think most of us, when we see a friend, a Facebook friend, post something that we disagree with, we bite our tongue and move on. You don't post a rejoinder, you don't respond <coughs> with a criticism because you don't want to be a troll, you don't want to be, uh, to inflame things. But I, I do wonder whether, you know, you want your life to be easy, you don't want to log back on on Facebook and find 17,000 replies to your message or whatever. Um, um, uh, um, I think, you know, this is where the question about what, what our duties are given uh, the age of reason. I think, you know, the first step certainly to thinking about what we value, right? Do we value a, a, an open society where free speech is important? and contributes to a liberal democracy in the way that philosophers like Kant uh, envisioned it would. Um, uh, if, if that is a base, so let me take a step back. I think the first step is understanding really what the foundations are of the kind of society we, we, are, we inhabit and are citizens of. Canada is a liberal democracy and liberal democracy is founded on these ideas of public reasoning. Um, so understanding the basic assumptions of the social structures that we take for granted is a really important first step, right? And then once you understand the, once, and I don't think, I mean, I got taught this stuff in, in school. I don't have kids, so I don't know what kids are being taught, but that would be a reason to, to shape education. And then once, you understand the basis for the society that you take for granted, then you can think about how to preserve that society. And part of that is responding to people who dis disagree with you, whether it's in person, on social media, uh, through writing letters to the editor. Um, it is really one of the things that I'm actually quite heartened about is the very lively letters to the editors. Um, read your local newspaper, your national newspaper. There are many points of view articulated in letters to the editor that show that we can all cohabit with people who disagree with us and articulate reasons and we get different perspectives. We've got the distance of the newspaper that no one reads on paper anymore, but there's something that's lost by not having a paper newspaper. Where Reading online is a different, different dynamic. So I don't know if that answers your question. It's more hope. I think there's hope, but I do, uh, I do um, appreciate the feeling of despair <laughs> at the same time. We really have to uh, have to find hope and, and rehabilitate it in in, in public reason. Uh, anyone else with a question? Oh, good. Fine.
Thank you, Lisa, for the uh, presentation. My question is about Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> yeah. So his uh, yeah. style and his frequent tweets in social media and expressing his own opinion, whether right or not, do you see this, and because of his position and his uh, influence, and you said this is not an unlevel playing field yes. about. So do you see this as a step forward in building a community by thinking critically, but because he you know, just voices his, express his opinion right or not and, and draw strong opinions and, and responses from around the world. Do you see this as a step forward or do you see this as a step backward? I think that's a great question. I do think if nothing else good comes of Donald, Donald Trump, let me lay my political cards on the table, um, uh, it's that we've all been forced to attend to things that we take for granted. Um, and that's not a bad thing, right? So people are reading the US Constitution that haven't read the US Constitution in 40 years or longer, right? Um, that people are articulate, being reminded that they live in a liberal democracy uh, and what that actually involves and that it isn't actually something that will continue forever just because it's a liberal democracy. Um, so, you know, time will only tell whether it's a step forward or a step backward, I think. But it ha I mean, Donald Trump has provided the occasion to really um, reflect on, um, on how we live and what we've taken for granted and what we value. Um, and to be forced to take a stand, really. Uh, I think that's what, um, in some ways, that's what makes Donald Trump so challenging uh, for people, is that it is really hard to remain on the fence with Donald Trump, right? Either you embrace him or you really are scared of him. <laughs> and uh, um, that forces you to, to really think about why you're scared know what the people who embrace him think actually but they have their point of view uh, as well in terms of what they are getting you know the, he's articulate he's captured a, a voice that wasn't very loud at all uh, in American culture and given a megaphone to it um, and uh, and at the same time has really brought a whole other set of voices to the fore and uh, having a platform for articulating real democracy is messy. So we're at the messy part now. <laughs> um, Canada is sort of, I, I, I have often said that the parliamentary system is in some ways way better than the US system, which is not a parliamentary system. Why? Because parliamentary system has question time where you have, you know, a loyal opponent <laughs> whose job it is to raise objections and to argue the opposite side, whereas that's not the way the U.S. Congress is structured. Um, there isn't a loyal opposition. Uh, there's two parties that have to vote together. So it's, there's something really substantively different about the, the Canadian system that, um, that always has a forum for public debate uh, in a way that doesn't always happen in the US so much. Well, a heartening note to end on. <laughs> I'm going to suggest that we carry on the conversation. I, I believe we have some uh, pizza. Please uh, join me in thanking Lisa for an excellent introduction. <laughs> and I'm going to encourage you to carry forward some of the ideas here um, about how we can all contribute to building community by thinking critically. It's important and it's incumbent upon us to recognize our duty to do so. Feel free to email me with ideas about how FAST can carry forward this discussion. Thank you all for coming today and on behalf of FAST I would like to present a small token of our appreciation to Dr. Shapiro. It is um, an indigenous artifact, and hopefully it will contribute to uh, enlightened reason. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much for coming. And uh, feel free to join us and carry on the discussion with Lisa. Thank you.